Okay, let's get started then. So thank you everyone for coming. It is great to see so many people um, attending this workshop. Um, so hopefully teams can handle the amount of people. If there are any kind of glitches or issues or disconnections, uh, don't worry, we are recording this locally. So just my screen, my audio and my video. And we will be putting that on YouTube later if there's any issues now, or if you want to come back later to have a look at that. And so um, the etiquette for using Teams, uh, when you're in this main call, um, please keep your mics muted just because you know, static adds up. Um, but when you're in the breakout rooms, then feel free to um, be unmuted, um, you know, have your video on if you'd like, um, whatever you're happy with. So the main link you're going to need is uh, this one that I'm popping in the chat right now. And this is um, it's also in the general chat if you can access that easier. And this is a link to the, um, the resources and the template we're going to be filling in in the session. Because the end goal of the session is we want to make something like this. But we want to do it for ourselves. So we're going to be filling in our own, own template and making an output like that. So uh, in, this, uh, in this link, you'll find uh, three links inside of this. So to uh, a help guide, uh, an empty template, and a completed template. So the help guide is the thing I'm going to run through now. That's some kind of like introductory notes on what we're doing. And then you can open the empty template that's the thing we're going to be filling in throughout the breakout rooms, um, which is going to hopefully be the final product, which will create your visualization. And then if you, at any point you are completely stuck, you can have a look at a completed version, copy things across um, to get that working. And then once the recording uh, is live, obviously can't be live now because we are doing it, um, it will be linked there. So you can have a look at that. Okay, so the goal of this session is to make something like this. This is what we promoted on the event banner. And this is um, a visualization of all of the music that WDSS uh, exec members listen to. And so we took all of those those songs and then turned them into a big wall of music. But the important thing is, it's not just um, randomly arranged songs. Like that, that would be kind of boring. That, that would be just, you know, downloading images, sticking them together. There's no data science there. But what we've done is actually, and what you'll do in, in this notebook, is to kind of go even further um, and to, okay, um, we're going to go even further and try to arrange things so that um, similar sounding songs are near each other. And you can actually see this has happened um, in this visualization here, that we have uh, these two albums here, or um, the two Stone Roses albums here. We didn't tell our algorithm at all who wrote the song, uh, what album they, they were from, what the song was called. We just told it what they sound like um, based off kind of the data Spotify gives us. And so from that, it managed to figure out how to put things in similar positions. And so really something quite clever has happened here. We've ended up with kind of a map of our music taste with similar sounding things put together. And that's exactly what we're going to be you know, working on trying to get to at the end of this. So the format of teaching, um, we're gonna have three small kind of teaching bits and then three breakout sessions. So the teaching will be me working through this help guide, kind of giving you some information. And then from that, we're going to go into the breakout rooms, which will be smaller um, groups to kind of work through the um, template and try and get your solution working for yourself. And so there'll be about 15 minutes, um, 50 minutes teaching, 50 minutes breakout, alternating like, like that. The first teaching will be a bit longer just so we can cover a fair bit more stuff. Um, and so at the end of that, a few of us will, will hang around if you have um, questions, if you know, you're trying to finish it off still, or um, you just want to ask about the society, about the event, then um, we'll hang around for a bit. You can talk to us then. Okay, so the style of teaching. Um, the important thing to note is that you're not meant to follow everything. This is an introductory taster. We're going to show you what data science looks like, but we're not going to teach you the whole of data science in an hour and a half. So if things are going a bit fast, if it's hard to follow everything, that's not a problem. That's not the point at all. Um, and so hopefully this is just going to give you kind of a sense of what data science looks like enough to motivate you to attend our other courses and start to learn this stuff properly. And the key idea to mention is that this seems like quite an advanced, complicated project, um, but I, I actually made this a year ago after learning Python for less than a year, maybe, maybe about 11 months. And so that was all part time, you know, just putting in a bit of time um, on the evenings and weekend. So if you started learning a bit of Python now, you know, through our courses or independently, in less than a year's time, you could be making your own thing like this from scratch. So hopefully that's kind of a very exciting possibility. And so one other thing to mention is that this um, solution, this kind of this notebook is quite polished. So we've had two beta testers who 
um, you know, very thankful for them, spotted many typos and, and mistakes, and we had those all fixed. So this looks like it was put together quite nicely and it all works. Um, but that was not how it was actually made. There was lots of struggling, and lots of um, glitches, lots of, you know, why isn't this working? And so you're not gonna see that in this session. But if you do want to see that, um, then I have a blog post because this um, session is actually based on a blog post I wrote a year ago, which kind of tackles the same sort of problem. But I've, cr I've um, wrote out my steps, uh, all of them, even the mistakes and even fixing the mistakes on all of those. So if you are interested in seeing what data science looks like a bit more realistically with all kind of the nasty um, kind of confusions and difficulties, that's something to look at to get a more realistic perspective. So I'm going to pop that in the chat now if you want to have a look. If you're watching the recording, you can just Google um, T-Tested Wall of Music and you should be able to find that. Okay, so uh, we're going to start by yeah, looking through this help guide, introducing some coding concepts, and then we can go away and actually apply those to um, these problems. And so if at any point you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. We've got um, Martin and Unique, I think, on standby to help answer any of those questions. Okay, so we're going to start off with some fundamentals of running code. And so for this teaching bit, you don't need to be doing anything. Just sit back, try and take it in. And then in the breakout room, that's your time to really give these things a go and um, work them for yourselves. <clears throat> okay, so the most important thing is um, we're using this program called Colab. And so if you follow the link in here, you will open Colab and you can run your code in here without having to install anything, without having to set up anything at all. It just works. And so if we want to um, add some code, to run some code, we're going to have to add a block for that code. And so we can do this by clicking somewhere and then clicking this plus code button at the top. And that's going to create a new cell or block that we can put code in. And so we can then type our code in here. I'm going to type some code like this. Let's not worry about what it means just, just yet because we'll see what it does. So I'm going to type this out. And then if I want to run this code, I click the play button. And then it'll just take a second to connect uh, the first time. We're connecting to a Google server that gives us all of the computational power. And then once that has connected, this will run. And the output is below, hello world. So what we did here, we printed out the words, um, hello world. And that's kind of the, canon the canonical example um, of your first kind of coding example. And so um, that's how we can run code. If you want a shortcut rather than pressing play, we can use control enter, that will run it, or command enter on, on Mac. If we um, have some really long running code, or we get ourselves stuck in an infinite loop, then we can stop that. So if I do while true, so this is gonna just keep running something again and again and again. I'm gonna print um, hello. This is gonna print out hello an infinite number of times. It's gonna keep on going, um, never stopping. So you can see that's being filled up all there. There's loads and loads of them. So I can stop this by running, uh, stop this from running by clicking the square here. So I press that, that stops it, just takes a second, and now we're back to normal. Okay, so now I'm gonna just delete that cell there. The instructions, you can find these following the help guide if you need to refer back to these. And one more thing to mention, actually I'll put this down here. Python typically doesn't care about spaces and new lines. So I can write something like print, a load of spaces, a bracket, uh, hello, put some spaces here. I should put a new line there. Python doesn't care. Uh, so in most cases, don't worry about that. Uh, if an error does come up, then that's what you should ask your mentor about. Um, and so it is worth mentioning, though, that Python is case sensitive. And so if I type something like print with a capital P, that's not OK. Um, so you have to get your capitalization right at every point. Uh, but you know, if an issue comes up, then just ask your, your mentor in, in the breakout room. They'll be able to help you with that. Okay, so let's have a look at the um, uh, the template here. Okay, so this is the sort of thing we're going to be looking at uh, filling in. So I got to that by going to uh, the enter template, clicking that to open it. And so there's a lot of stuff in here, but all the stuff we really need to worry about is these um, to-dos here. So a lot of the code is filled in for us, and what we're going to do is to um, fill in these sections where there's a task for us to do. So in this case, there is a to-do saying we need to um, import this thing from, from, from that. We'll explain what that means in a second. And then below that, there is this um, kind of blank space we can put our, our answer in. 
So we would delete this thing, um, the underlines and the quotes, and then write in our answer there. And so uh, these hashtags here, what these mean is ignore whatever is um, after this. So these are called comments and they're used to kind of explain what our code is doing. So this here, this is proper code, Python will run this, but anything after a hashtag, Python will not run this. This is just kind of some extra notes for us, uh, not the computer. And then another type of thing we have is these checkpoints here. So this is short for checkpoint. These are optional things that you can do to kind of check um, what your data looks like, make sure you understand what's happening. So you're free to skip these if you want, and they won't affect actually whether you get to the output or not. But if you want to follow these as well, it might help you understand what's going on. Okay. So carrying on with the help guide here, we just delete this one because we don't need that anymore. Okay, so let's start by talking about these things called imports. So at the top of this code here, um, there are loads of these kind of import things. So what's going on there? Um, oh dear. So what's happening here is we're importing these things called packages. And packages are collections of pre-made code and functionality. So the beauty of Python as a language is that it's what's known as open source, meaning anyone can use it for free, can add to the language, can kind of you know, create their own features. That's really powerful because you're not waiting for a single company to add features. If there's one person in the world that wants a new thing added, they'll add it and you can use it. And so kind of the idea of Python is that we never reinvent the wheel. If someone's made something for visualizing um, map data, don't do it yourself, use their version. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. We're importing a load of other people's code, a lot of other people's functionality. And so there, there are a few ways that we can do this. So the simplest is just to import some package. So import, this is the OS package. It's related to operating system things, checking if a file exists, that kind of stuff. We can just import that as normal. Sometimes we want to import something under a certain name. And in that case, we use this as word. So import the NumPy package as, give it the name, NP. And we do this because we're going to use NumPy quite a bit. And so it's nicer to have a shorter name to refer to it by than the whole thing. And one final way of importing is when we want to import just a single kind of piece of functionality from a package. So to do this, we use this from um, uh, syntax here. So from a certain package, import this single function. And so we use this when we only want, you know, one bit of functionality from a package. It would be confusing to import the whole thing. So we just import a single thing. And those are kind of the examples. We see we have some to-dos here. You can base these on the existing ones to try and um, replicate those. Okay, and so actually talking about packages, I want to share this thing called PyPy or PyPI, which is the Python package index. This is a repository of all or most Python packages. And you'll see here, there are over 260,000. And so that is a lot of functionality. Um, pretty much anything you want to do in Python, there is a package for it already. And so you can get an awfully long way without having to do anything complicated yourself, just use other people's work. And that's you know a really great way, an efficient way to be coding. Okay, so let's get into some fundamentals. So we're gonna start by talking about these things called variables. And these are a way of giving Python memory. And so it's very important to be able to store memories because otherwise our code is very much here and now. Do this, do that. Um, it has to be you know, very much present. But what we would like to do is say to Python, hey, can you just, just remember this thing for later? And then somewhere later in your code, go, hey, you know, you remember that thing I set um, a while ago, can you use that for me? And so we use variables to achieve that sort of thing. And so the way we create a variable is like this. So we take a value and then we use an equals and then we have a name for that variable. And so what we're saying here is take this value and assign it to this name here. And so an important note that names can contain letters, numbers, underscores, and hyphens, but not spaces. So if we would like to use a space, we typically use an underscore instead. And so the, way, the reason we use variables is that whenever Python now sees this variable name, it will remember that you set it to this value and replace it with that value. So here is an example of this in place. So we uh, take the number 45 and we assign that to the variable RPM, so revolutions per minute. And now Python knows that whenever we talk about RPM, we mean the number 45. 
So I can print out RPM and Python goes, oh yeah, yeah, I remember you setting that to be 45. I'll replace that with 45 for you. And that's what happens, we end up with um, printing 45 here. If we then set RPM to a new value, uh, say to um, 78, then when we go to print out uh, RPM now, it now has the value 78. So it takes the value of the last thing you set it to. Now this is an important point to note that Colab lets you run things out of order. So I can now go back and I can run this RPM equals 45 by pressing the play button and then go back to print this thing at the bottom. And now this is going to say 45. It doesn't matter that this line appears first. It's the order that we press play in, not the order they appear on the page. And so we can keep track of that by looking at these numbers on the left here. These tell us the order in which the code cells were ran. So 12 is a small number, so it went this one, this one, then 15, 16. So that's the order they happened in. But my advice would be always run things from the top down. It's just a much safer way of doing things. If you want to run multiple things in one go, you can use this runtime menu at the top. You can run everything, run everything before a certain cell, many more options below that. An extra point to note is that um, very high level parameters, things that kind of govern the behavior of the whole project, um, those tend to be denoted using all caps, so all capital letters. Okay, so there are very various different types of variable, and that's kind of different types of data we, that we can store with Python. Uh, we could store text data, we could store numbers, we could store um, logical values like true and false. But the important thing is, whenever we want to create text data in Python, is we have to explicitly say this is text data by using single or double quotes. And single and double, they mean the same thing uh, to Python, so you can use either. So if we want to create a variable greeting that has some text data hello, we have to use single quotes when we're talking about hello here. Otherwise, Python won't know that this is text data. So here we set greeting equal to hello, print out greeting. Python goes, oh yeah, I remember you set that to hello. I'm going to replace that with hello. This greeting here, we're using uh, double quotes. No problem, Python can handle those just fine. Print that out, we get hello again. But if we forget to use the quotes, then we have a problem. Um, because Python's going to look at this and go, okay, well, you haven't used quotes, so it can't be text data. It must be a variable then. It tries to remember, you know, when did you set the value of, of hello? But you never did. And so Python gets very confused and gives you an error saying, you know, hey, you haven't defined this, you haven't given this a value yet. And so, sorry, I can't do anything with it. Okay, so another thing to talk about quickly is this notion of functions. And so functions are the way of getting Python to do something. And they all look very similar. It's um, the name of that function, then some brackets, and all the inputs to that inside of the brackets. There could be one, could be two, could be many, or none, in fact. So if we did something like this, this would run a function, um, you know, whatever function name we use there, and it might give us some output, might do something else, whatever. Now, some functions are going to return a value, give us a value back after they've been run. And so often, if you know a, a function does this, we'll want to assign this to something for us to refer to later. So here we run a function that's going to return a value, and then we're going to assign that to some variable. We could call this anything. And then we can use this name here to refer to whatever value was returned here at a later point. And so one other thing to mention is that some inputs have names, and it would look something like this. So here we have a function, just a normal input. This one has a name, so you know this could be um, could be x, could be color, could be whatever. It's the name of that input, and we just set that equal to whatever input value we want to use. So the key thing to kind of you know, reiterate here: you don't need to understand all this stuff perfectly. Just having seen it is the more important thing. Okay, and also some functions kind of belong to a package. Um, or this thing called a module. And in that case, we access them by using uh, what's called dot notation. So there's the numpy package. We saw that earlier. This is for doing a lot of mathematics. So we'll import numpy, give it the name np, and then we can access a function that belongs to, to numpy, to this np, by taking np dot and then doing a function as normal. So all this is saying is that this identity function, it belongs to numpy. And sometimes there'll be multiple dots, so numpy, take the collection of kind of random things and um, create some uniform random variables. That's going to create a matrix of uh, random numbers between zero and one. 
And so we've written some helper functions in, um, in this document. You'll see them all at the top. These are just kind of make your code easier and uh, look nicer. You don't have to touch these, you just have to run this cell here. So you can click play, that will, will, will run it, and then you're done with that. And then you can use these um, in your, your code to make things easier. Okay, so we're going to have a quick look at data structures. So we, we saw above how we can um, store single values, so store numbers or text. But that's kind of boring, you know, we're living in an age where there's all these buzzwords, big data, cloud computing, all that kind of stuff. We want to sink our teeth in some meaty data. Um, and to do that, we're going to need a bigger data structure. And so we're going to look at two key structures in Python. Um, this is not um, a comprehensive list, but it's um, two examples. So the first thing we're going to look at is called a list. And that's used for storing um, sequential data. So an ordered list of items. Think of this like your shopping list, for example. That is a list. And we create a list using square brackets. And then we fill it with um, elements of that list separated by commas. And so here we create a list with square brackets and we pass in four elements, uh, these text data, Rio, London, Beijing, Athens, separated by commas. And then we're gonna take that and we're gonna give it the name, we're gonna assign it to the variable past Olympics hosts. And this kind of makes it a bit clear why variables are so important. I wouldn't want to have to write this out every time I wanted to use it. I'd much rather have a shorter name. I mean, imagine this has, you know, a thousand elements. I would not want to type that or copy and paste it every time. So a variable name is like a short way of referring to this data here. And so then we can access variables, sorry, elements from this list by um, using these things called indices. So these are non-negative integers. You can think of these as like the house number for the data. If like you wanted to find someone in the house, you need to know, know their house number. And so the only difference between Python's house numbers and real life house numbers is that Python starts from zero. So the first element here, Rio, has index or house number of zero. London has one, two, and three. And then we access um, a certain element by following the list name. So here it was called past Olympics hosts with square brackets and the, um, the address, the index, the house number of the item we want. So here we use one, zero, one. So this is the second item here, London. So another useful data structure is this thing called a dictionary. And these are kind of used to map one value to another. And kind of one way you can think of these is like flashcards. Um, your flashcard has a front side, which has some sort of value, uh, kind of a question almost. You flip it over, then there's the answer on the back. And dictionaries kind of do that sort of thing. So they map one value, the question or the key, to the answer, which we call the value. We create these using curly brackets, and then we have these pairs um, separated by a colon. We take those pairs and then separate them by commas. So for example here, we have a um, dictionary of capital cities. So we have these pairs here. That's one pair, two pairs, three pairs. So the first one says that uh, the key, Spain, that's kind of the front of our flashcard, when we flip it over, the answer, the value, is Madrid. And so we're kind of saying here, the capital of Spain is Madrid. And we have multiple ones of these separated by commas. And so we can access a, um, a single value from um, a dictionary in the same way as we would a list above. But rather than using um, a number as our index, we use um, whatever kind of the front of the flashcard that key was. So in this case, we could put in Spain here and we're gonna get out Madrid. Okay, um, and so the last thing we're gonna look at in the fundamentals is these things called for loops. And so what we've seen so far allows us to do some powerful things, but we have to manually specify everything we want to do. If we want something done a hundred times, well then we have to write it a hundred times. And we're busy people, we don't have time for that. And so we would much rather have a way to run one thing or similar things multiple times. And a loop allows us to do this. Now the most common type of loop in Python is called a for loop. It allows us to iterate or loop over some, you know, some, some data. And we're gonna use a temporary variable to keep track of where we are in that loop at any point. And so this looks something like this here. So we're going to use a for loop. So it's a for loop, we start with four. And we're going to loop through each city in the past Olympics host list. That was something like this. So there's four cities here, you know, one, two, three, four. And we're gonna loop through each one of those. 
And so each loop, city's going to take a different value. Each time it's going to be one element of that list. So it's going to be Rio first, then London, then Beijing. And each time we print out a hyphen, followed by the city name to get uh, all of these here. And we also might want to loop over a sequence of numbers. To do this, we use a thing called a range object. Um, this is a function that takes two numbers and we will loop from the first number all the way up to, but not including the second one. So here we go uh, for, can n's gonna keep track of where we are. And I should point out this city and n here, these can be called absolutely anything, but you tend to choose an appropriate name. So we're gonna loop from two up to five, but not including five. We don't include the second number. Then we print out n each time. It's gonna be two, three, four. And so that's what gets, gets printed out each time. Okay, so we're now gonna talk a bit about um, Spotify and how we can access data from Spotify. And then we'll be wrapping up. Very soon we can go to the breakout session. Okay, so let's talk about APIs. So an API is short for Application Protocol Interface. It sounds very scary, but all it is, it's a way of us communicating with some service or database. So one example is Google Books has a database of um, loads of books. So their titles, their authors, their reviews, lots of information about that. And if we want to get that information, we use an API. A good analogy is that an API is like a waiter. If I went to a restaurant, um, I wouldn't go into the kitchen myself and tell the chef what I want to eat. Um, I would ask the waiter, can you go tell the chef I would like this? If my request is valid, if it's on the menu, then he'll go do that. Otherwise, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, um, sorry, you're gonna have to choose something else. And that's what an API does. The waiter in that scenario is the API, it communicates between you and that kind of um, backend kind of uh, technical thing. And so an API is literally just um, a web address that you, you can go to. So here is an example for the Google Books um, API. I go to, the, to this web link here and it gives me information about the book Python Data Science Handbook by Jake Vanderblas. I could change the, this number here. This is the ISBN, the unique identifier of a book. I could change that and that's gonna give me a, um, a different book uh, outputted. And I've linked here a list of loads of free APIs. There's some crazy ones in here. Um, examples of um, uh, cat pictures. You can get one on kind of like um, on Bitcoin. You can get kind of inspirational quotes, like loads of things you can get for free. Okay, and so Spotify has an API. And so um, anyone is free to use this, uh, whether you have a free membership or a premium membership, but you have to be signed in. And the reason for this is that um, Spotify don't want you to be, uh, say, you know, scraping a, a billion songs from their, their, their database that could, you know, slow down their service, or maybe you could be up to like nefarious purposes, stealing their data. And so you sign in and then they'll kind of monitor what you're, you're using. Um, and as long as you're not going crazy, you know, like tens of thousands of things, you'll be okay. They'll let you go um, doing as much as you want. And so to um, set this up, you have to go to developer.spotify.com. You can click the link here and sign in with your Spotify account. And then from there, you can go to your dashboard. So I'm going to open this here, go to my dashboard. It should sign me in automatically. Oh no, okay, log in. I'm signed in, in here. And so I have an app already, but you'll just have a blank space here. And what you'll do, you'll click create a new app, create an app, give it any name, doesn't matter, any description, click these boxes and then you're all good. Then that will open something that looks like this. And so you'll be given two pieces of information, your client ID, think of this as your username for um, accessing the API, and a secret, which is like your password. Um, you don't really want to be sharing your, your secret, you could click this button to see it. Um, it wouldn't be the end of the world if someone got it, because it's a free API. Um, but if it was one you were paying for, then you wouldn't want other people using it. Okay, so uh, you follow those steps, put in anything for the description and name, doesn't really matter. And then you need to keep track of your client ID and secret. You can just, you know, copy these somewhere or just keep this open um, for later use. And so with these credentials, um, you know, with this ID and secret, you're able to access any publicly accessible data from Spotify. So any users' public playlists, um, track artist or album information, uh, you can get Spotify to do analysis of songs, give you kind of the audio features, um, but you can't get any private information, like a user's um, private playlist. You can't manipulate um, a user's playlist or anything like that. You can do that with the API, but you need one extra level of security that we're not gonna get into. If you want to learn more about that, there's two links here to teach you how. 
Okay, so we're almost at the end of this section here, then we'll go to the breakout rooms. The other teaching sections will be a bit, will be shorter, so don't worry about uh, fitting this all in. Okay, so there's this thing called Spotify, and this is a package. We'll, we'll see um, at the start of our code, we import this. So, uh, well, this is the to-do, we're gonna import Spotify. And this is um, what's known as a wrapper for the API. So we could access Spotify or the API directly using um, a web address, like we did for the Google Books one. But that's a lot of fuss to do. Um, it would be easier if there was kind of a nice interface that kind of avoided us going through the browser to, to do it. And so Spotify does just that. And we create um, a client, and we're gonna call this SP, and we're gonna use our, um, our ID and our secret, our password to do this. And then we can use this to make queries to Spotify. So for example, we could run sp.featuredPlaylists and this would tell us what the currently featured playlists are um, on the Spotify homepage. So you'll also need to use your username. If you want to find this, you can follow this link here. So if I follow this, um, it might ask you to sign in and then your, your, your username is here. And if you can't find that, if you're struggling, just copy this. This is the Warwick Data Science Society um, Spotify account. You can use that. Um, so, so yeah, so you have an ID for the API. The username is a separate thing. You'll see in the actual notes um, when you need which one. Okay, and so the last thing we're gonna talk about before we get um, into the breakout session is um, data scraping. So we're gonna collect data from Spotify and we're gonna use that for our visualization. So the first thing to mention is that the Spotify API returns its results using a thing called pagination. Sounds complicated, all it means is that it returns things in batches, only a few things at a time. And this is exactly how Google works. So if you search something on Google, you get the first page of results, and you go to the bottom, click next page. If Google returns you all a million billion results, um, that would be overwhelming. And Spotify does the same thing. It returns up to 100 things in one go. And so it would be an absolute faff to kind of go through all these pages um, automatically, write code to do that. So we've written a helper called dpaginate, which will take the returned value of the Spotify um, a request and just flatten that out into a single page. So you can use this, you'll see it used in the code. That is what that is doing. And so what we're gonna kind of do at the end of the breakout session is, um, is to collect audio features about um, the songs in our playlist. So that includes like, the tempo, the key, how instrumental it is, how danceable it is, loads of different things. You can find a full list of the features here. And then we're going to use those as the foundation for deciding how to lay out our wall of music. So that's where we're going to leave things now for um, this main call. We'll join back here in a bit. We're now going to join the breakout session. And I think we're going to stay in that um, until 10 to. Um, but I'll message the mentors when it's time to move back out. And so we're going to have um, six breakout rooms. Um, and those are at different levels. So there, there are three types of breakout rooms. There is the what breakout room. That's literally, what should I do? Like, what do I have to do to make this thing work? If all you really care about is getting this thing working, um, then that's the sort of room you want to be in. There is um, how, which is, you know, how is this thing working? You know, how do I get to, to the, the solution? That's kind of asking, you know, what is the code here doing? And then the final one is why, and that's kind of why is the code written the way it is? That's kind of the most advanced one. So you can pick any of these rooms. Um, there's six of them um, of three different types. Uh, try to kind of, you know, not all go in the same room. So there's kind of only, you know, a reasonable number in each. Uh, you don't have to leave this call. If you go back into um, the, uh, the the Teams group, uh, you can join the other call. I'll just put you on hold in this one. If you want to leave this, this call, um, if that's easier, you're welcome to. So we'll join back here at 10 to, um, and I'll let, let the mentors know when it's time to do that. Okay, so yeah, I'll see everyone in the breakout rooms then. Okay, so... The next part we're going to look at is um, processing our data, trying to kind of uh, take this raw data and doing some more interesting stuff with it. So the first thing we do is to convert our data frame into kind of a more, a more powerful structure. And so this is um, called a data frame, um, and it's not part of the standard installation of Python. So you need to use a package called pandas, which thankfully we imported um, at the start. Um, and so this kind of... Um, yeah, so the, the way we, um, wow, I'd say. Yeah, so 
we can print out a pandas uh, the, the, the pandas data frame just by typing its name out, uh, and that was going to print it in a nice tabular format. If you only want the first few rows, then we would um, kind of take the data frame, whatever it was called, doing dot head, so head for like the top, and so that would be the first few rows, and then data frame dot tail would be the bottom few. Okay, so our end goal is to try and make this um, this grid of music, and so. Um, this is going to be um, impossible to do if the dimensions of our grid are um, are difficult to make a rectangle from. So you can imagine that we have um, a number of tracks that could be a hundred tracks. If that's the case, that we can easily make a ten by ten square. That's going to look great. But if we add just one more, we now have a hundred and one. And so a hundred and one is a prime number. The only way we can make a rectangle with a hundred and one squares is when it's a one by one hundred and one rectangle. Um, and so that is not ideal at all. And so that would look really ridiculous. And so there's this parameter right at the start of the script called min ratio. And that sets the minimum ratio that we're um, okay with accepting. And so I have it set to 0 0.5. That means um, I'm not willing to have one side be more than twice the length of the other. If it was one, we'd say it has to be a square. If it's zero, anything goes. And so um, what we do, we take the initial number of tracks and then we reduce it until we can find a rectangle that matches this, this constraint that has you know a reasonable um, rectangle in terms of its ratios. And so we can do this with um, a helper function we've made called find valid sample count. So we would put in our data frame, put in our min ratio, and, and from that um, they, will, uh, they will calculate uh, how many values we have to re remove. And then we randomly take a sample um, of the existing Columns, like just you know a random selection of those to make our reduced data frame. Okay, so and at this point we have um, a data frame with a good number of tracks, um, and we have all the audio features collected for them. So kind of their, their tempo, duration, all those various things, and those are all pretty good, apart from the key that there's a problem with that. And so if anyone is familiar with um, music theory, they'll they'll know that in normal Western music. Um, there are 12 notes, they go C, D flat, D, E flat, E, etc. Uh, and they all go right round to B. And then the whole thing wraps around again. We start uh, with C again. And so computers prefer numbers to text. You know, they're computational devices, numbers work a lot better. And so these uh, keys have to be encoded using the numbers 0 to 11. And so Spotify have done this by having C being 0, D flat 1, and it carries on in that fashion until we get up to B being 11. But here's the problem. If you're familiar with music, or I guess the alphabet, you'll know that B and C are quite close together. And yet with these encodings, they're the first part you possibly could be. So something has gone wrong there. We need a better way of kind of capturing the relationships between these numbers, um, or between these keys. And the way we do this is by um, recognising that this system is cyclic. And cyclic um, you know, cycles are to do with circles. And so what we do, we take all of these keys, and we draw them around a circle. Let me show you this below. So we draw them around a circle here. So C, D flat, D, E flat, E, F, F sharp, and carry them all around the circle like this. And then what we're gonna do, rather than representing the keys with a single number, we're going to use two. One for its um, X coordinate, one for its Y. So C is gonna have um, the values uh, one and zero. So it's X of one and Y is zero. D flat's going to have um, an X of 0 0.705, if I know my high school tri trigonometry correctly, and then um, a, uh, a Y of 0 0.5. So we use both of those, and now we have those kind of dependencies that now C is close to B and D flat, as we would like. But now, um, if you know even more mu music theory, you'll know that actually this doesn't, doesn't quite do it. That actually, C and D flat are actually quite different keys. Um, because there's this thing called the circle of fifths. And that kind of shows how close keys are together in a way. And the order of those is completely different to the one we saw up here. Actually, C is very close to G. Whereas, just going by the alphabet, C and G are quite far away. And so, actually, it would be good to represent them both using this method and by using the circle of fifths. And so we do both of them. And um, there's this helper function called melt to harm which takes these values uh, 0 to 11 here and converts them so that they're um, following the, this kind of way around here. So 
C is going to still be zero. Uh, whereas D flat was one, it's now going to be um, seven because it's seven around here. So that's a nice helper function. And then we can um, kind of copy our code from this bit, which I give you the code for this, uh, to do a similar thing for these harmonic ones. So these here are referred to as kind of melodic distances and the circle of fifths are harmonic distances. Um, but you can copy a lot of the code that's already in the notebook for that. Okay, and so that's going to give us um, uh, some more useful columns. But here's the problem now. Those variables are on wildly different scales. So the um, the tempo, that's somewhere between like, I know, 60 and 180. The key is between 0 and 12. Um, oh no, sorry, between minus 1 and 1 now. The duration in milliseconds, that's like in the hundreds of thousands. So these all have completely different um, centers and scales. And so what we want to do is standardize them. That means center them around zero and scale them so they have the same um, sort of variance. And so that will look something like, like this. Imagine we start with these three variables here, variable one, two, and three, all have different centers, different widths of distributions. So this is kind of showcasing uh, how dense the values are at certain points. This is, this is saying most of the values of uh, the first variable are around this point and they're quite narrowly centered. Here, this variable, there's a wide range of values here. So the first thing we do is center it, so put things so they're all at zero, and then we scale them so they all have the same width. And the reason we do this is so that all of our features have the same importance. If um, we use them in their raw form, then duration is going to seem a lot more important just because it's bigger. Okay, so that might sound like a lot of statistical gibberish, um, and it is, but you know, thankfully this can be done very easily using a package that you know, we can get from Python. Um, we create a thing called a standard scalar and then use a thing called fit transform, put our data inside of that. You'll see an example in the, um, in the template and it's just you know, one line of code does all of that for us. Okay, and then one more thing we have to do is, um, so because we have split the key into two keys now, the harmonic and the melodic one, we divide those columns by a factor of two. Otherwise, we would bias our models towards those because we, we have twice as many of those features. Now, we had a lot of debates in our research team of whether we should be divided by two or four, and we couldn't really reach a, conclu a conclusion. So um, feel free to try both of them. And if you want to discuss that with us, then bring it up in the breakout sessions, um, offer your own opinion. Yeah, we'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, and then the, yeah, the next thing to look at, and we'll get back to the breakout sessions, is this thing called dimensionality reduction. So currently our data... Um, we have like you know, the track, album, and artist information. And then we have all the audio features. We had 13 originally, and we turned that into 16 by expanding the keys into these, um, these new features. So 16 dimensions of data. Now, I personally struggle to visualize 3D. Um, like a 3D graph, that's complicated. So 16 dimensions, not gonna happen. Humans just can't really do that. And so thankfully it happens that often when we have high dimensional data, it's possible to represent it in a lower dimension without losing much information. So for an example of this would be if two features were highly correlated, you could predict one from the other, but you could actually throw one of them away, you'd be all right. And so what we want to do is take these 16 and reduce them down to two. And so I want to kind of give an example of this uh, kind of happening in real life. So I've got a piece of paper here. And imagine this is all of our data, that, um, that all our data lies in this flat sheet here. So our data here is two-dimensional, um, but it's existing in 3D now. The world is 3D here. But if I take this data and I structure it up, now this data exists in 3D because it's no longer flat. Um, and so this is more complicated data, maybe hard to visualize as a person. But what I could do is if I had some very clever maths, I could take this and I could try and flatten it out again, bringing my data back to 2D. And that's what dimensionality reduction is trying to do. It's trying to take very complicated data and flatten it out. Now, in this case, the data was originally in 2D. So I can easily take that and flatten it out. But say my paper had a, you know, a lump in the middle here, I then couldn't flatten it out perfectly. I'd have to kind of squash it down, at which point I've distorted the data slightly. And that's okay. Like, we don't need a perfect reconstruction. We just need most of the information being um, kept along. And so, this process of reducing dimensionality is called an embedding. So we take the high dimensional, the scrunched up paper, and then flatten it out, embed it into a low dimensional space. I want to preserve as much structure as possible. So there's two types of structures. There is um, the global structure, 
That's kind of saying if I have large clusters of data in the original space, they should be close together in um, the lower space. So that could be, you know, the same genres in the original space. They, sh they should be together in the final thing. And then there's also like local structure, which is if two things were really close together in the high dimensional space, they should be together in the low dimensional space. Now, unless our data is like the paper where it naturally has a low dimension, um, we can't do this perfectly. So instead we have a balance between global and local structure. And we control this with these things called hyperparameters. And you can have a play around with those, see which work best for you to balance off between global and local structure. And so the exact algorithm we use is called UMAP. It behaves very much like the paper um, example there, just with a lot more maths. And we can use kind of fit transform like we do with the standard scalar um, that we talked about above. So yeah, very complicated algorithm. It was released only a few years ago, so it's really cutting edge maths. If you want kind of a simpler introduction to dimensionality reduction, look at this thing called PCA. There's um, a link here to look at later. Okay, so that is um, the end of this part here. We'll now go into the, into the breakout session. We'll stay there until 20 past, then we'll just wrap up this stuff here. And then if you want to head off at that point, you're, you're free to. Otherwise, I think a few of us will hang around a bit longer. Any questions help you um, finish off your code. So I'll see you all in the breakout rooms then. We now have um, something that looks a bit like, let me show you, something that looks like um, this. So we've taken our 16 dimensional data and flattened it down into just two dimensions. It looks something like this, but this isn't very grid-like. Um, and so we're going to want to flatten this out into a square grid. And we can do this using a package called Rastafari. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we're going to like Rastify. Uh, this is a word that I probably made up, I'm not sure, the points to make them fit into, into a grid. And so the reason it's called um, Rastafari and you know, Rastifying is because a raster image is... Um, an image made up of square pixels. So basically a grid of, uh, of images. And so that's where the package um, gets its name from. And so the process of, of um, using Rastafari looks something like this. So hopefully this comes through all right. Um, sorry, not even playing, but there we go. So we start with data like that and then it kind of smushes it all out into a square grid or a rectangular grid if uh, we had that number of points. So um, that's what we're going to use. And um, we're going to plot that in the exact same way as we did the embedding plot um, a bit earlier. Okay, so then we're going to visualize the image. Um, we can create this final image by stitching together multiple bits of cover art. Um, and then you know, once they're all stuck together, that's the final image. So there's a peculiar thing to look at in the code, which is that all the references to rows and columns and um, height and width are flipped whenever we're talking about... Um, stitching these things together. And that's because we stitch them together in a matrix and matrices um, record their dimensions in the opposite order to coordinate systems. Like coordinate systems are you know, X then Y, matrices are Y then X. So just be aware of that. Um, you don't need to worry about it if, you know, if that's not um, something that you, know, you followed there. Okay, and so the final thing is gonna be an interactive visualization. So let's have a quick look at that. So. The final thing is um, an interactive version like this. And actually, if I add a little extra thing here, so add um, one extra line, it's gonna add even more information to the plot. And now I can hover over it. It'll not only tell me um, who wrote the song, but all the features of it. It's not very clear in the color. You could change the color if you wanted. Um, but we have an interactive plot where I can look through all of the, the different um, kind of artists and their songs. And we see like, you know, some uh, kind of promising thing patterns here, like, um, well, I guess, um, I, I, I don't know all, all of these songs because they aren't online. I'll leave that then. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, the way we do this is, is quite fancy that we put an image in the background and then we add a heat map on top with the labels and we um, set the opacity to zero, basically make it transparent. Um, and so, and then add the labels on top. And one thing to note here is that because this image can get quite big, if you're using a high resolution or a lot of um, songs, Colab might crash. And if it does, you can then run this program on your computer. Um, and there's instructions, uh, if you follow you know, the link in the chat, uh, which we'll also post on this event page on Facebook later. 
Um, that will explain how you can um, do that on your local computer. It should work better there. Okay, so that's the end of the teaching. We'll go to the breakout rooms um, at the end. We're probably just going to use breakout rooms one, two, and three. So if you're in breakouts rooms uh, four, five, and six, just move yours down by three. Um, and so to wrap things up, um, if you've enjoyed this session and would be interested in more things like it, more teaching, our full workshops, um, our events, literally anything we're doing in this society, make sure you're following us, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, those are our main things. Links are at the bottom of this help page. If you want to get more heavily involved in this society, uh, maybe get involved in a research project, um, want to kind of give a talk, kind of help out with our events and stuff, make sure you're signed up to our community group on Facebook. That's where all those kind of... Um, those opportunities to get involved are all placed. If you're um, interested in chemistry or politics or finance, um, physics or maths, we have this um, web page of subject examples. These are examples in Python that um, are relevant to a certain subject. So we have an example of how we can use Python for chemistry data or for um, pol or political data. You can have a look at those or our research blog for kind of inspiration on what you can do with data science. And finally, that's the wrong thing. Um, we're looking for a marketing officer. So if you know a marketing officer, um, you know it doesn't have to be someone that knows that much about data science. We want someone passionate about marketing that can help the society grow, help us reach more people and help more people. If you know someone that's into marketing and can do a good job, um, you get in touch with the society. You can message us on Facebook or hello at warwickdatascience.com. There's a link here. I bet this is gonna link to the graphic designer one. It should have linked to the marketing one. Um, so yeah, just contact us directly, either on Facebook or by email. Um, but if you know anyone, we would be very interested in that. So with that, we're going to join back into the breakout rooms. So breakout rooms one, two, and three. Thank you everyone for coming. Oh wait, sorry, but before you go, I'm going to pop a link in the chat to feedback. So um, if you have the time to fill this in, kind of say what worked, what didn't, um, maybe a bit about you, your kind of um, your subject background, that would be really helpful to know, can help us make better events in the future. So that is in um, this chat now. Please do fill it in when you get a chance. Okay, so I'll see you all in the breakout room then.